Hi, my name is Jalen Panadosi. I am a senior at UVM um, studying film and television studies. Um, I'm here joined by um, Sarah Nilsson, a film professor at UVM, and Amy Seidel, a professor at UVM um, teaching environmental studies. Um, today, we are at CCTV discussing environmental issues and just like the impacts in Burlington. Um, I guess so just to start off um, our conversation, um, I'm just going to ask you guys just like questions that you can respond to, whatever. Um, so how did you guys get like interested in the environment, like growing up, I guess, and what made you choose your career to study the environment and do things that like you deeply care about because of the environment? Oh, okay, we'll start with me. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, which is not a place you typically think of as environmentally aware or conscious. It does have, I think, the most Superfund sites of any state in the country. In state in the country, but I um, grew up in an area that was semi-rural. I really loved being outdoors, and as early as I could, I started doing actually trail work, in national parks with the Student Conservation Association, which was an, an outing organization. And got I, I've always loved animals, and I've always loved being outdoors and being able to leave um, New Jersey as a high schooler. And I went to Yellowstone. I spent a summer in Yellowstone backcountry, and then I spent a summer in Arizona backcountry. And I just loved being outdoors. And so, when I went to college, I went to Dartmouth College. I ended up doing. Um, English and environmental studies. So, and most of the English was creative writing, and I got interested in film and started doing screenwriting. And I also was my interest in environmental studies started then. And so I've always been sort of involved in animal studies, um, environmental studies early on. I ended up going to film school though, and I have was more focused on sort of racial issues in film and social justice issues. And more recently, probably within the past 10 years or so, I've been teaching much more classes that involve environmental studies, racial issues, and film. So that's sort of the crossover of those interests. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, so, so similarly, I had a family who was really, really interested in birds. And I would go birding with my family all the time and we would keep lists of birds, we would wait for certain birds to arrive every year, we would, um, it was sort of the way people kept track of baseball statistics, you know, we kept track of birds. Mm -hmm. And so I went to college and I was so interested in, in natural sciences and like Sarah, I was also interested in the humanities. So I, um, my degrees were in, in natural science and in poetry. As I left um, being an undergraduate, as I graduated, I became a pretty much a field itinerant biologist, <laughs> and I studied uh, systems all around the world. I studied polar systems in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and tropical systems and temperate mountain systems. And I really saw the world and, and saw the incredible variation of ecosystems that exist on the planet. And it was not all of them, but was just stunned and awed by them. And so I decided to do a, a PhD, first a master's in entomology, the study of insects, mm -hmm. and butterflies in particular. And then I began working on the effect of climate change on alpine communities, in particular um, these really interesting creatures that after the last glaciation 10,000 years ago exist in the highest altitudes in, the nor in North America. So that you can imagine they're a pretty good thing to study, a pretty good organism to study with it warming climate. So that's how I got into it and then I found myself in environmental studies as an ecologist thinking what I really like to do is think interdisciplinarily about these problems because mm -hmm. the challenges are so complex. Ecology and natural science are really important but the humanities and the narratives and the policy and the sociology of how we're here and the ethics of the values we hold that bring us to these challenges or help create these challenges are as important as the science. So environmental studies for me is a home where I can be an ecologist, but I can also be an interdisciplinarian. Thank you guys. <laughs> um, I guess moving on to um, just like talking about like Burlington and like recent weather, 
Um, I'd like to ask you guys, um, obviously the past few days um, it's been ranging from like 30, like 40 degrees, which is pretty nice, I guess, after the negative degree weather. Um, but a few weeks ago it went from like being like 60 to like 30 or 20, which was like a drastic change, not just 30, 40. And since you guys like understand like just like climate change and stuff, I was wondering if you could describe like its effect like on the Burlington community, I guess, and what like effects, like anything you could talk about. This one is all Amy's. Oh, okay. I'll take <laughs> As a film historian, this is not mine. <laughs> I'll take this one. So when I teach about uh, the variation you just described, which is so spot on, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of variation in weather. And uh, there's variation in weather with and without what I call human-induced climate change, which is the phenomenon we're experiencing. But with climate change, uh, we see more variation, and we also see a strong signal towards warming. So imagine a graph that has a lot of jagged lines, which is that sort of 60 to 20 to 60 to 10 kind of variation. Mm -hmm. What we see, or what atmospheric scientists see, is that our climate over time has a signal of warming, for sure. Spring is coming earlier, winters are shorter, uh, summers are hotter, and there's a lot of noise or variation around that signal. So the nature of the of carbonating the atmosphere is to have changed our weather, which is our climate over time, um, as well as to bring more variation to uh, our temperatures and to see some really clear signals. The early arrival of spring, probably more like two weeks, three weeks earlier, um, and these other kinds of um, generalized events, warmer summers, shorter winters, essentially a climate that's looking more and more like, um, like Appalachia like um, North Carolina. Okay. One thing, I mean, I'll add to this too. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you're pointing to though is the widespread use of climate misinformation. So we're talking a, a fair amount in our class right now yeah. about climate denial. And one of the strategies is exactly what you did to say, well, look, it's really cold right now. There's an Arctic front coming through. Like, how is this global warming? We've had these long winters or we've had this long, you know, events. And that's often used for climate denial. That's actually like the number one strategy to use to say, well, there's no heat in the, of the planet. You know, look at here. And, and actually, Donald Trump did this. He often mentioned, like, there's no climate change. Look how cold things are. Look how things are going this way. So just thinking persuasively, like, how do you counter that argument when you can say, look, it was freezing this morning. Mm -hmm. Look at it. killed all these plants. Or, you know, these weather looks so odd. But something you had mentioned, like the, the melting of the lake, it's been years since the lake has been frozen. Like, mm -hmm. it, there are clear indicators, even on this sort of local level, of things that you would, anybody would notice and be like, hmm, that's a little concerning. Like, maybe I should think about this, even though I'm hearing other voices telling me that this is just an anomaly, or this is, you know, not typical, or this is an odd and exceptional event. So. One, I mean, the, the flood of misinformation out there is constant and continual. I just read that Twitter has a 30% increase since Elon Musk took over on Twitter of climate denial and climate misinformation. And one of the biggest discourses people use is what you're talking about. Like, there's no consistency in weather. These are just random events. They're just happening, and there's no, like, overall evidence, even though there is predominantly overwhelming evidence that human caused climate change. And there's also a very strategic um, strategy to not use global warming. So the climate denial people do not want anyone to say global warming. They want you to say climate change, because climate change doesn't sound threatening. When you say global warming, all of a sudden it gets scary, because all of a sudden it means, uh-oh, we're getting hotter and hotter. We all know we're getting hotter and hotter, but how do we deny that's occurring? We say it's random. We say you know, it's, it's not just getting hotter. It's getting colder. It's doing this. It's doing that. I know we talked a lot that, about that in our class, um, just about how, like, the scary terms because it's like happening like that's why people like denial lists or whatever they want to like say like oh there's what you said like oh like well the ice the arctic whatever there's still ice or snow or whatever yes. so but it's because it's like happening right now is why people are trying to justify it it sounds like well i think it's like how do you make a pr and the, the interesting thing about there's a study that came out looking at who is posting all the misinformation and it's not random individuals it's very intentionally done by the fossil fuel industry the petroleum industry they are the number ones po pe no, corporations 
posting, you know, denial, climate change denial. So they're hiring very well-paid PR people and publicists and strategists knowing how to create messages that are really persuasive. I mean, it's frightening if you look at all the posts on Twitter, on Facebook, they are being orchestrated by these massive multi-million dollar corporations that we are funding with tax dollars that are destroying our environment. So this idea too that climate denial is coming from, you know, a random Joe in his basement is absolutely not true. There are orchestrated public relations attacks that are met know very well how to persuade people, make them feel uncertain, to question what they're thinking, to see things as, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe I shouldn't worry. And, and, and it's when you look at the actual amount of money being poured into that climate denial strategy, it's scary. It is scary. And then how do you counter it? So I mean, it, there's clear evidence by every climate scientist that the planet is warming. It is global warming, but when you have all these very heavily invested players not wanting you to hear that message, you end up with all this confusion you have in this country and the inability to act on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Thank you, Sarah. That was, <laughs> it's just, so, it's just that so much clarity there. And I really appreciate the, the data around Twitter, too, and, and the, the landscape that we live in around truth and narrative and, and, and false information. And I'll say that um, for, for more than a decade, um, the uh, Mason University and Yale School of, of, of Communication has kept these real, this really good track, they call it the Six Americas, in which they survey the American population around climate change and the gradient of complete denial, as Sarah just characterized, and people who are ready to act, act actually asking to be taxed or asking to be put in a position where they are where it's demanded of them that their communities and themselves are, are acting on climate change. So the whole range. And what we have seen over time, over this decade of, of polling, is some variation, but increasingly 70, 73, 75 percent falling in those Americas, because they divide us into six, from denial to ready to act, who are ready to act or who accept, who are no longer neutral. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what is a powerful kind of question in film and television and, and media studies is how is it that the same landscape that we're all living in, where there are clear changes, as Sarah says, you know, the, the lakes don't freeze not just here, but in Minnesota. The mm -hmm. Ottawa River did not freeze, you know, this year um, and has been melting out earlier and earlier. These kinds of things are so clear to our human sensibilities of season and time, that um, that signal and other kinds of truthful statements are winning the day. The question now is, as Sarah so aptly said, will the support of fossil fuel industry and the system that continues to carbonize our atmosphere um, for the benefit of their profits be ultimately politically made, um, you know, to not only disputed, but ultimately a crime, because it is a crime to, to not transition to something that is ultimately not releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess this is kind of segueing a little bit, but I just wanted to ask you guys this both um, this similar question that I had from both of your classes that I just came up with. Um, I know we both have talked about like indigenous populations um, recently, and me and Sarah's class were talking about um, marginalized communities and how like they're the ones who are being like the biggest affected by climate change. And I was wondering if you guys had anything to say about that, or just, um, I know um, we have the Abnaki tribe in Burlington, um, how like tribes like that maybe be like reacting to climate change since, I mean, they don't have as many resources as we do, but their like populations like that are being the most affected by it. Well, maybe I'll start. Go yeah, ahead. so I think that, I think that what you're saying is a, is a really, um, it's a, a point of real attention for us because absolutely uh, vulnerable populations to climate chaos coming in the form of, for, of wildfires and floods and other kinds of climate implicated storms, which we can actually look at their probability and know, okay, much higher probability that those storms are going to happen um, because of climate change, because of global warming, is going to affect um, brown and black people 
people who are under-resourced who are living in vulnerable areas. And that includes indigenous communities as well. And um, this has been very clear right now. And so climate justice is at the core, I think, of the climate movement. And, uh, and is increasingly, I see, a front and center starting place around policy. And the way we mitigate the impacts of climate change is to say, who are the most vulnerable? How do we resource those vulnerable communities? Sometimes the response is those communities may need to move into new landscapes. And this is a very complicated issue because, as you say, with indigenous communities, they may have been there for literally millennia. Mm -hmm. uh, Alaskan communities having, you know, evidence that they have resided for four or five thousand years in a, in a, on an island, perhaps in the Pribilof Islands. So this is a, an extraordinary time for cultures and communities to um, be so impacted. Um, and I think that finally, climate justice is at the fore of, of policies and of people who are leading, if I will, the climate movement. I see more indigenous voices. I see more voices from the BIPOC communities that are the most vulnerable. And I'm really happy to see that change because for a long time that wasn't true. So from a film perspective then, so the question is how do those voices get represented in some way that you know is mainstream audiences would be exposed to. So it's true, when you're within an environmental movement, people are very conscious of climate justice. When you go to, you know, CPAC or you go to these meetings and everyone's talking about, especially this latest meeting was all focused on sort of reparations and how do we deal with the damage that developed nations are doing on indigenous communities across the world. We don't see it anywhere. So we don't see, I mean, we've been reading in class, the narratives we see about climate change don't focus on, you know, the women that are being impacted, the children that are being impacted. What we do see is a lot of negative attention, especially on migration, on um, climate immigration. So all that we see in the media portrayed in a very negative light. I mean, I can't think of a mainstream movie anywhere that's telling a narrative about those populations and how they're being impacted by climate change. So just thinking in terms of like, as a humanities-based person, how do we tell that story? How do we make that story accessible to a broad audience and not just sort of the community talking about these issues? Mm -hmm. So how do we bring it into conversation with people to make it something that is important to them, that they would care about, that they're invested in. And so just as a communications point of view, I mean, we conceptually talk about it, we think about it, we care about it, but in terms of who's controlling message, what stories are being told, where are those movies? Where are the movies about those communities? Where There's documentaries that get played at certain festivals, but the, the crossover has not happened. I mean, I struggled in my writing climate change class to come up with a handful of films dealing with climate change. I struggled. Mm -hmm. And you would think a social issue right now, so important, nobody's telling that story. We're getting another superhero film. We're getting, you know, another sort of raw, raw American action adventure film. It's certainly not being filled with narratives about climate change. So, like, where do we begin? Like, where do we begin telling these stories in a way that's accessible to others? I mean, literally, we're talking Wally. -E, you know, happy feet. Like, I mean, I couldn't find any films for my class. It was very frustrating, besides documentary. But again, that's a niche audience. They are on board before they even watch the film. It's not going to change their point of view. It is not speaking to the percentage you're talking about, which is like 30%. I mean, Americans that still deny climate change is pretty significant. So why are we not talking to them? Why is film not being produced that speaks to them? Why is programming not? And the amount of climate denial is rampant. It is rampant on social media. It is certainly present and is certainly sort of muddying the pool in terms of these conversations. So of course we care about indigenous people, but where is their story being told? Where mm -hmm. is that? So, so from my point of view, it's like we have a long ways to go before we actually get those people, you know, their voices heard. They've always been marginalized, they're always silent. No one's speaking, you know, speaking their story. I was just gonna say, since you were talking about like documentaries and just like those types of films more showing like climate change, um, I thought of like just like the Vermont International Film Festival and just how I was thinking, right. oh yeah, maybe they might have like more things on climate change, but I guess you're right, especially 
from our class. We've they looked do, at though. that too. I mean, they do definitely. There's been a focus and awareness, and there's there's more films this year. There were a few films in the Academy Award that dealt with issues about climate change. So there's definitely an animation, the short animation film, and the short documentary subject one were both about issues of climate change. So it is being produced, but it's not the big films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was Don't Look Up. That came out the, mm -hmm. Like Leonardo mm -hmm. DiCaprio tries to produce material that's sort of talking to a broader audience, but no one even understood that film. Like a lot of people thought it was about the pandemic. So if you're going to make a climate change film, you would hope it'd be about climate change and not mm -hmm. the pandemic. Like if the audience doesn't even understand that, that's a pretty bad sign. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why are you incapable of even when you intentionally want to make a film about climate change, you can't even explicitly state it's about climate change? Are we so resistant to presenting this material? We're so afraid audiences are going to turn away? It's frustrating. I mean, that's really sort of the challenge for our class. And we've been spending the semester talking about how do you tell stories about climate change that you know are factually correct, that are sensitive to diversity issues and voices that are not heard and that are marketable, that someone's willing to produce. And it's, it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and I'm thinking as you speak about you know, <laughs> what films, and the one Give film me that, some. that comes Give to me mind some. is Beasts of the Southern Wild, <laughs> yes. um, which is a, an incredible film, a, I don't know, eight years old mm -hmm. maybe now, um, about the Louisiana Bayou um, in particular, and, and people who have been compromised by the placement of levees that actually protect others and then make other co communities more vulnerable. So um, a really powerful, sort of almost surreal uh, film about um, those communities living in the Louisiana Bayou, so close to sea level, so easily inundated by sea level rise. But it, it really, what Sarah's saying is really kind of making me think about uh, why is it that, um, I that we have this sort of almost fits and starts to narrating what is obviously a historic and planetary event. You know, there's never in the history of the planet has, um, has there been this event, this rat, well, there has been similarly rapid, but never, um, you know, human-induced event, right? Mm -hmm. Such that we have actually eclipsed the next ice age. So rather than entering another ice age that we would normally do based on the geometry of the Earth in, um, in the universe, we will, we will not be doing that. We will stay warm through the next, what would be an ice age otherwise. This is a powerful story to tell. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only that, but there's a powerful, there are powerful messages of how communities are responding and how human empathy is an incredible through line in us and sense of place and concern, right? That these, that, that while we know that the power lies oftentimes in profit motive and and, and things that we could characterize as not caring. Um, there's tremendous amount of municipal and state and local concern for each other. In fact, that's why the idea of, of sort of climate adaptation, while it might appear transgressive, like, well, if we can't mitigate it, we should just stop mitigating or trying to mitigate, we should just adapt. But in fact, it's here, we're living through it. We will live through it because of the nature of the fact that the atmosphere has changed. So what about stories about how we are adapting, how we are simultaneously mitigating and adapting? I think that could be, I hate to draw this analogy, Sarah will probably maybe disagree <laughs> with me, but it has a little bit of a wartime feel. Do you know what I mean? Like there, there needs to be heroics, there needs to be great empathy for one another. There needs to be, um, yeah, there needs to be some winning over uh, because we all want ultimately the same thing, which mm. is a life that is secure and safe uh, for ourselves and our families. I mean, I know that sounds so basic, maybe ideal, but I think it is a through line in, human, in the human dilemma. And we, I mean, we've read in class, I don't know if you've read Amitav Ghosh. Yes, yes. So his, I mean, his book, The Great Derangement, is yes. all about why we are incapable of telling stories about climate change. And his point is that it's so sort of cataclysmic that we as humans can't fathom it within our normal modes of fiction writing. I mean, you've read the article. So, I mean, 
his basic argument, which I think in many ways is persuasive, is that it seems so beyond reality and so implausible that to put it in a narrative, nobody would believe it is the basic argument that uh, modern novels function in a certain way and the stories tend to focus on interpersonal relationships contained within a like understandable world. And if you start bringing in catastrophic flooding, tornadoes, which he experienced, hurricanes, it seems into the realm of the fantastic. It gets into the realm of sci-fi. And those genres we don't accept as real. We don't accept them as, you know, plausible. So it partially, and I think it's an interesting mm -hmm. argument, mm -hmm. is the problem of, you know, how do you speak these tales in a genre that people will buy as happening today? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if we focus too much on the sort of catastrophic, it becomes something that we don't think of as present. Mm -hmm. And especially a lot of, sci there are sci-fi films dealing with climate change, actually quite a few. Mm -hmm. Sci-fi is the mm -hmm. one genre, mm -hmm. but that tends to be the place where you do you drill, deal with the fantastic, with the, po you know, what might possibly happen in the future, but not what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And so that's, and he's gotten more, I mean, he was just here speaking and, the talk and I got to, yes, and got to, I got to talk with him later and he, he's pretty hopeless, I'd have to say at this point. And mm -hmm. it was kind of interesting because he was sort of like, I don't think narratives are gonna help us get over this. I mean, based, but we are not even at the point where we're telling narratives. I mean, we're still trying to figure out what that means. And people are, it's not that people aren't. But in film, it's really, it's really absent. And there's many structural reasons why. I mean, I'm not just saying it's because of the subject matter, but there are not voices being heard expressing what's happening in terms of climate change in any sort of real way or addressing other voices that are not like dominant male hero, white hero narratives. And that's not helping us. That's, that's definitely not representing sort of mm -hmm. the reality of who's in being impacted by climate change. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, I don't know if that was very hopeful, <laughs> no. actually. We're sort of balancing each other. We have hope here. <laughs> um, just to kind of close things off, I guess, um, I guess I wanted to, you guys to talk about, obviously you guys have both made these drastic changes in your life. Like, um, Amy, you live like in a remote area. You have the um, electric car and the solar roofs. Like, <laughs> Sarah, you like don't eat meat, you thrift, you do all these things to limit both of your impacts. Um, um, I guess just like a small statement you could say like for somebody watching this who wants to do something to change their carbon impact and like where they could start. I, I mean, I'll start with this because it's been interesting to me and as part of our conversation in class, I've realized there's all this emphasis on anxiety. And like I, I said to my class, and it was just because we were talking about like, why don't we have anxiety about poverty? Why don't we have anxiety about gun violence? Why don't we have anxiety about racism? Why don't we have anxiety about like really serious pressing issues? And I think we've gotten into this trap of linking climate change with anxiety, which leads to inaction. It's become sort of a, a formula to me about like, this is too overwhelming, I can't deal with it, it's not you know dealable. And so partially I think we have to move to like, what are practical things you can do that are reasonable, and doable, wearing thrift clothes, anybody can do. Mm -hmm. Cutting back on your meat consumption. I mean, if you look at the main drivers of climate change, meat consumption is like the number one. Does everyone need to eat beef every day? Does everyone need to go McDonald's? Like, is it really that difficult to cut back on meat consumption? Is it that difficult to ride your bicycle? Is it that, you know, it's like, do you need to buy all kind of tchotchkes from Amazon every day? Do you need an Amazon truck going to your house every day? Like, there are definitely structural things all of us can do that are not cataclysmic and shouldn't be associated with, you know, the collapse of humanity. But it's gotten to this point, like, to ask for even little things, and I think it's because it feels so overwhelming and so beyond doable. But there are, to me, the message should be focusing on all of us can contribute in certain ways, and they do have impact. I mean, the other sort of great climate denial thing is you can't do anything. It's beyond any human contribution. One person can't do anything. And that message is just so defeative and anxious causing and creates people not acting. So like, don't eat a hamburger every day. You know, buy some used clothing. Most people wear one outfit seven times and throw it in the trash. Wear your outfit eight times. Like, do you really need to go get fast fashion for a new outfit every day? Like, it's those small things. And I know they're hard, but they're doable and they're definitely contribute. They do contribute. You can make a contribution to what's going on. <laughs> wow, so this is such a rich area. And I, I completely understand why when we're given the news we're given or we're reading something, becoming more knowledgeable about an issue, 
we want to be morally aligned because otherwise we have this feeling of cognitive dissonance. We know something's up and our behavior is not in, in, co in, in, in consonance with our action. Um, and I would, I, would, I, would, I would ask us to, to think critically about the individual level. I think it works in order for that alignment, for us to feel like we are morally um, sound individuals acting appropriate to the knowledge that we have. But when we take it up a scale, we realize too that p one of the um, strategies is to diffuse this issue across individuals, to say it's, it's the amount of flying you're doing or it's the amount of consuming you're doing. When we exist in a system that is run on cheap fossil fuels that now we understand has this inadvertent but now very, very, um, very, very just, just cataclysmic issue of carbonization of the atmosphere, of global warming. So that system needs to change. And that system changes through political action and, and, and us acting in a democracy in this country of demanding that we no longer use a fossil fuel industry in our world. So absolutely, I agree with Sarah that that moral alignment is key to our moral well-being, but we need to think at the scale of this is a system that is a political economic system run on cheap energy that can no longer run on cheap fossil fuels. It has to end. And the way it ends, just the way we ended, you know, the subsidy of tobacco or um, you know, eugenics movements or, or other things that were nefarious for society that were social ills was politically. And, and that's where I think ultimately uh, the change needs to happen. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you guys for coming thank in. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jalen. <laughs>